focus on headliner. Now let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio, we have our reporters, Kwon Zua and Son Bo Gyeong. Guys, welcome to the program. Good, Good evening. evening. All right, so I'm sure uh, we were actually watching it right before the show. We did have a live newscast of it, watching it before we uh, got into the studio. U.S. President Joe Biden did arrive at the Osan airport. He is here in South Korea now. Of course, the first ROK U.S. summit uh, to be held tomorrow as well. So let's get some updates on this, Po Gyeong. Sure. So I need to change my script now. He actually arrived around 5.30 p.m., just about 40 minutes ago at the Osan uh, complex. So it's his first trip to Asia since taking office, and he chose Korea to be the first destination in Asia. The first ROK U.S. summit with President Yoon Suk-yeol will be held the next day, which is tomorrow, the 21st of May. The summit will be held only 11 days after President Yoon's inauguration. It's the first time a summit will be held this soon, and this is why there are high expectations for a stronger alliance between the two countries. And upon his arrival at the Osan Air Base, he actually head directly to Samsung's chip complex, which is located in Pyeongtaek, Gyeonggi province. And the reason why Biden will be visiting the complex first is probably because of his efforts to strengthen cooperation in terms of global supply chains and economic security. It is also expected that both countries will be talking about creating synergy effects with the U.S. chip designing technologies and South Korea's manufacturing capabilities. President Yoon will accompany Biden in this trip, and Lee Jae-yong, the vice chairman of Samsung Electronics, will be giving a personal tour to the two presidents. It's also expected that the two presidents will be giving a speech declaring technology alliance between the two countries. On Saturday, Biden will visit the Seoul National Cemetery to pay respects to those buried there. Then he will move to the presidential office in Yongsan and hold talks with President Yoon. The talks will mainly focus on dealing with North Korea's nuclear weapons program, economic security, and regional cooperation. Both countries expect that Biden's visit will serve as an opportunity to advance the Korea-U.S. alliance into a more comprehensive strategic alliance. And as North Korea's seventh nuclear test and intercontinental ballistic missile test launch are known to be imminent, measures to strengthen deterrence against the North are expected to come up during the summit meeting as well. It is not known how Yoon will respond to Biden's warning messages against China, but the two leaders will hold a summit with a small number of people first, which will be followed by an expanded summit in the presidential office for 90 minutes. Then they will also announce the results of the talks at a joint press conference later in the day, as well as the ROK-US joint statement. During the summit, Yoon is also expected to announce South Korea's participation in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is an in- initiative proposed by Biden to ensure secure and resilient supply chains, set the rules of the digital economy, and invest in clean, modern, and high-standards infrastructure. After the talks, Biden will participate in an official dinner hosted by President Yoon, which is scheduled to start around 7 p.m. The event will also be attended by the 10 major business group leaders. President Biden will visit Osan Air Base on Sunday to encourage U.S. and Korean troops, and Yoon is expected to accompany Biden in Osan before he leaves for Japan later in the day. So this time, Biden will not visit the demilitarized zone that borders North Korea. And Biden will be staying in Japan until the 24th. He will attend the Quad Summit and hold a summit with the Japanese Prime Minister Kishida Humio. Uh, Gang, thank you very much for that uh, very <laughs> thorough uh, rundown of his uh, itinerary. Yeah, I'm just uh, watching a live clip. Uh, you guys can't see. I have it in my computer screen okay. right now. Uh, of uh, President Biden and his uh, convoy headed over to uh, Pyeongtaek at this time. It is interesting, right? I mean, the very first thing uh, President Biden is doing is making this tour around the Samsung Semiconductor factory this evening as soon as he touched uh, lands on Osan Air Base. Um, it is uh, one of the things that uh, I'm looking at right now. It is a uh, rush hour right now. There is some traffic at this time, which is why there's some delays as to when uh, the the address between the two leaders are going to mm-hmm. take place. But nevertheless, 
I, just the fact that he is making his the very first stop here in South Korea being at Samsung, uh, there is a, quite a bit of a significance behind this. So, so uh, let, let's go through his uh, uh, stop over at the Samsung chip factory. Sure. So President Joe Biden chose Samsung Electronics, a semiconductor manufacturing plant in Pyeongtaek, south of Seoul, as his first stop of the three-day visit here in South Korea in a bid to underline the strong trade and economic ties between South Korea and the U.S. and especially to enhance the two countries' alliance in advanced technologies. I think Pogyuk did uh, mention that uh, briefly. Now, President Yoon song yeol will be accompanying President Biden, and uh, they will be guided by none other than Lee Jae-yong, Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman. This is the first time a U.S. president is visiting the Pyeongtaek plant, which is the world's largest semiconductor plant built on 2.89 million square meters of land, which is the size of some 400 soccer fields. Memory semiconductors as well as advanced non-memory semiconductors are being produced there. Now, former U.S. President Donald Trump had expressed his awe for the plant back in 2017 during his trip to South Korea, but then uh, he was flying past the complex inside a helicopter. Yeah, yeah. So he was looking down and uh, was uh, quite uh, surprised by the size of this. So nevertheless, this is the first time a U.S. president is making an official visit there, which demonstrates Biden's extra interest in semiconductor cooperation with South Korea, which he has mentioned on other occasions. Uh, especially as the global shortage of semiconductor supplies in the past months impacted the U.S. manufacturing sector, including the production of cars, partly due to stalled shipments of Chinese-made components on the back of factory shutdowns. Uh, Washington looks to be seeking for a stable supply of semiconductors while simultaneously reducing China's influence in the semiconductor supply chain. Seoul is also highly dependent on U.S. equipment for producing chips. So to answer the question on the significance of uh, President Biden's first destination, I would say uh, it is uh, it represents a symbolizing of developing even stronger ties in the bilateral semiconductor industry with South Korea and furthermore, give a message to China, but also other semiconductor powerhouses. Yeah, basically the United States right now, there is a shortage of uh, semiconductor chips and they're basically saying, listen, now we're, we don't need to rely on China. We have our strong ally in South Korea. Uh, just looking at some live feeds of the uh, trip right now, uh, President Joe Biden has arrived, arrived. Mm -hmm. yeah, at the uh, Samsung uh, chip factory there, which is uh, very quick, to be honest with you, considering it's a uh, rush hour. They do have everyone stand by. Uh, they're going to hold the talks there. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, let's get your thoughts on Biden making his first stop to the semiconductor plant here. Pogyang, starting off with you. So as Soa just briefly mentioned that five years ago when Trump visited Korea, he just flew past the uh, Samsung complex and he just went straight to Pyeongtaek U.S. military base. So I think this time Biden visiting the semiconductor complex means that back then Trump considered South Korea as a military alliance, whereas now Biden is really delivering this message that Korea is the technology partner or that he is promoting this technology alliance between the two countries though I think that is the main difference between then and now so this time it's really about economy technology and about this economic framework the IPEF so I think he's really showing the strong message compared to Trump. Yeah, I think you make a very good point. Uh, also, I mean, I, I do truly believe that Biden also believes that South Korea is a uh, military ally too, mm -hmm. right? But also uh, an economic partner. And uh, just a global shortage of semiconductors. Uh, I'm just seeing right now President Yoon suk uh, waiting for U.S. President Joe Biden to arrive inside uh, of the factory right now. It seems like uh, he is at the entrance of the Samsung uh, chip factory. But uh, so what about yourself? Your thoughts on Biden making his first stop to the semiconductor plant? Well, I agree with uh, Po Kyung's view on that. There seems to be a change in the focus of the alliance uh, 
from the past. And also what I want to add to that is that the trip to the chip plant may even be the beginning to what could become a new chip alliance, the so-called Chip 4 Alliance, uh, which would include the U.S., South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, all semiconductor powerhouses. And this is a proposal that the U.S. had made. So while this would further strengthen the Seoul-Washington ties, it can also be really, as I said before, a big message uh, to China. And that meaning actually for South Korea, although this is a positive sign for bilateral relations and also the semiconductor sector itself, it could also mean that uh, South Korea should have its eye on how China will re- react to this. All right. I'm just looking at this right now. President Yoon suk and uh, President Joe Biden have just met. I have just seen a glimpse of uh, Samsung Vice Chairman uh, Lee Jae-yong. Uh, right behind Biden. Uh, now they are taking a picture right now. I'm wondering if uh, you guys know if uh, Yoon suk speaks pretty good English because I, I just noticed that they were holding a slight small talk there without an interpreter. I wish we could hear this yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, right? We can't we can't uh, hear any of this right now. But there is an interpreter right now. Okay, so there is an interpreter at this time. So there are some discussions going on in between the two leaders right now. Again, for our listeners right now, uh, we are going to give you a live feed of the address between the two leaders at around 7.15 p.m. Uh, so do stick around for that. But the U.S., I, they, they're really making its move around to, to surround China, right? I mean, you look at uh, all these uh, different U.S.-led initiatives right now. Uh, South Korea considered a key partner in that very strategy. We talked about how South Korea being geographically an important, a very significant country for the United States. So at the same time, there are risks to this. So what are some of the risks, Po Gyeong? Right. So it's clearly an opportunity for South Korea to be one of the key partners in the U.S. semiconductor supply chain strategy. However, this also means that we will be at the front line of the most fierce technology competition between the U.S. and China. So, for instance, last year, the global chip market was dominated by the U.S., accounting for 54% of the market, and South Korea taking up 22% of the pie. Taiwan was third, Japan and Europe both accounted for 6%, and China took up only 4% of the market. However, this will change because China is moving up fast and furious. So the Chinese leader Xi Jinping announced the Made in China chip drive to invest 170 trillion Korean won into the semiconductor sector and become 70% self-sufficient in semiconductor production. Then, of course, came the immediate response from the U.S. So Chinese largest smartphone manufacturer Huawei almost went out of business And the U.S. also banned the export of high-tech semiconductor equipment. Now, the U.S. has come up with this new Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or the so-called IPEF. So unlike other economic frameworks, this IPEF values supply chains, anti-corruption, and human rights, which are subjects China doesn't feel comfortable about. So it can be interpreted that the U.S. intends to challenge China with this economic framework. The IPEF Inauguration Summit will be held next week in Japan, and President Yoon is expected to attend the summit virtually. According to pundits, having a cooperative relationship with the U.S. in the field of technology is crucial and can lead to benefits related to energy and infrastructure. However, there can be other risks as well because China will probably not be happy about South Korea joining this strategy of the U.S., In fact, the U.S. has been trying to include South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand and other Asian uh, ASEAN nations to the framework. But the countries are still weighing the benefits against the risks. That's right. Uh, You know, we were talking about this uh, yesterday with uh, Chihi and Sumin discussions on whether or not joining the IPF. Is that going to trigger China? Right. Uh, But at the same time, there's the RCEP, right, which is you have the U.S. led IPF and then you have the China led RCEP. So. It, it kind of counteracts each other. So tell us more about the RCEP and uh, I guess uh, moving forward on that. Right. So South Korea's foreign ministry believes South Korea's participation in the IPEF does not conflict with its membership in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the so-called RCEP. A foreign affairs official told reporters that the IPEF is regarded as an initiative to counter China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region, while the Chinese-led RCEP is a free trade agreement among the Asia-Pacific nations, including South Korea. 
The government also believes the IPEF will focus on reaching a political consensus and will deal with comprehensive issues related to future tasks, whereas the RCEP focused more on market opening. As for concerns about a possible backlash from China against South Korea for taking part in IPEF, the official explained the framework is an economic forum that is open, inclusive and transparent, and that he does not think it targets a specific country. The official also said that Seoul will closely communicate and discuss with Beijing, a very important economic partner, through the additional FTA negotiations and the effective use of the RCEP. All right. And, uh, of course, uh, part of uh, the, I guess, uh, itinerary that uh, President uh, Joe Biden has, he is going to be meeting with South Korea's top uh, business leaders as well. This including Hyundai Motor Group's chief, uh, uh, Chung Yi-sun, with whom Biden is expected to have another separate meeting during his stay here. So tell us more about this. Right. Uh, According to the White House on Thursday, President Joe Biden is scheduled to meet with the Hyundai Motor Group chief on Sunday, his last day of his trip. This reportedly will be a gesture of appreciation, with Biden expected to thank the car group's investment plan in the U.S. More specifically, as has been reported by AP earlier, it's regarding a roughly seven billion U.S. dollar investment in Georgia that will involve a construction of a massive electric vehicle plant near Savannah in Georgia. Uh, we are expected to, expecting details to be announced soon, and that's highly likely to happen during Biden's stay here. The South Korean automaker has established Hyundai Motors Alabama plant in 2006 and Kia's Georgia plant in 2009. Now, the new project, according to sources cited by AP, is predicted to create some 8,500 new jobs. Hyundai Motor Group earlier announced its midterm plan to invest $7.4 billion in the U.S. by 2025, adding it will increase the proportion of eco-friendly cars in the U.S. market by up to 50 percent by 2030. Yeah, this is the uh, the, the big project uh, moving forward, especially because uh, Hyundai and Kia uh, certainly investing a lot on the EV sector. And of course, uh, if you have factories like that, it's going to really uh, drive up the market here. Uh, also, both leaders expected to visit the Korean Air and Space Operation Center. Uh, can we get some information on that, Paul Gyeong? Right. So South Korea and the United States are fine-tuning details over a possible visit by both pre- presidents to <clears throat> a key Air Force Operations Center south of Seoul during Biden's trip to South Korea. So according to government sources, the two sides have been in talks over the visit to the Korean Air and Space Operations Center, or the KAOC, located at Osan Air Base in Pyeongtaek, which is 70 kilometers south of the capital, possibly on Sunday, which is the last day of Biden's three-day visit here, according to the sources. So since Yoon is expected to accompany Biden to Osan, both leaders will visit KAOC and be briefed on the security situation of the Korean Peninsula and the Allied Forces' readiness amid the concerns about the possibility of North Korean provocations. Since KAOC is the strategic command center of the Korean military in charge of the entire air and space operations of the country, this visit can be interpreted as a message being sent to the North that both countries' alliance is firm and stable. KAOC also carries out the K-2 operations, which is a combined operation of the kill chain and the Korean Air and Missile Defense System, KAMD, of the Korean Three-Axis Defense System. It's the first time that a U.S. president is visiting the KAOC. And earlier this week, Kim tae Hyo, who is the first deputy chief of South Korea's Presidential National Security Office, said that Yoon and Biden plan to conduct a joint schedule under the theme of economic security and security each day until Sunday. And during Biden's visit to South Korea and Japan, aircraft carriers such as the Ronald Reagan CVN-76 and Abraham Lincoln CVN-72 will be stationed close to the peninsula to respond to any provocations. The U.S. military also has flown a reconnaissance plane toward the East Sea, which is an aviation tracker, amid concerns about the possibility of another intercontinental ballistic missile launch by North Korea. Yeah, so the consensus is right now that uh, despite rumors, North Korea is not going to be conducting their seventh nuclear test as long as Joe Biden's here, right? I mean, that's... 
I, I wouldn't say it's a declaration of war, but it's probably like getting close to it. But uh, certainly there could be an intercontinental ballistic missile test, uh, even a short range one, that depending on how they, you know, carefully they're going to do all this. But uh, yeah, all eyes also on any kind of actions uh, from North Korea. Uh, we're going to move on to some uh, COVID-19 updates here. I'm sure uh, a lot of us are very glad that the situation has gotten a lot better compared to a couple of months ago. Uh, to the point where, again, I mean, <laughs> you have uh, Yoon suk and Joe Biden holding uh, in-person summits now. Uh, but uh, interesting, uh, the government this Friday announced uh, that they're going to kind of wait a bit more. Uh, before scrapping the mandatory quarantine rules for people who caught COVID-19. So let's get some details on that and uh, not to mention some latest figures on the, the infection figures. So, uh. Right. So first off, uh, the latest updates on daily infections, 25,125 cases were reported as of uh, 12 a.m. this Friday. So for the second day, the numbers are in the 20,000s, and that is also a drop by around 3,500 cases from yesterday. And it's also some 7,300 fewer cases than a week ago on a Friday. So it is. it also marks the lowest figure for Friday in 16 weeks. And with that, the daily average in the past seven days stands at 26,857. The number of people in serious or critical conditions stands at 251. So this number has been remaining in the 200s for the second consecutive day. 43 people have lost their lives in the past a day that's slightly more than the day before. Uh, while the decline in daily infections, severe cases and uh, fatalities continues to uh, s slow down, uh, there remain risk factors, though, including the emergence of new variants. And that's why the government decided to maintain the seven day mandatory quarantine period for COVID-19 patients for another four weeks until June 20th for now. Uh, and along with the detection of highly contagious new variants in the country, Interior Minister Yi Sang-min also mentioned at a briefing today concerns over deteriorating vaccine effects and possible immunity evasion. He said the government will make a re-evaluation regarding the quarantine mandate with officials and experts. Now, the lifting of this measure was predicted to be the next post-pandemic step the government would take, with today having been the last day of a four-week interim period to prepare for the removal of the quarantine rule. All right. So, guys, I, I know how Soa feels about this, uh, for <laughs> sure. But, uh, I mean, the extension, right? Uh, was this the right choice? Uh, let's start off with you, Po Gyeong. Well, I, I'm really for this. I'm not against this measure because I think uh, still, you know, I think the last measures that need to be scrapped is indoor mask wearing mm. and the seven-day quarantine of those who caught COVID. Because yeah. as we can see from New York and other parts of the world, the new variants are starting to prevail, become dominant again, and a lot of people have already caught the new variant. So I think it's too early, or we might maybe never get rid of this measure. So I think it's necessary because the government even says that probably in summer we will be seeing a hike in the number of cases, and um, this might prolong until, let's say, autumn autumn fall so i think we should still keep this so i'm really for this measure yeah i mean the consensus is i think uh for most part people think that uh, summertime everything is going to be okay but i mean it's the summertime when everyone's kind of going out and about right and when you have like these quarantine measures lifted there's just going to be more sick people going out and about spreading the virus and not to mention there's already so i believe you said there was the ba4 and the ba5 that was already reported mm -hmm. here in south korea right so that, that that's the game changer right if that starts spreading like wildfire then we could see again hundreds of thousands of cases uh, once again but so uh, you obviously think the extension was the right choice yeah i'm so glad that the government <laughs> did not scrap the mandatory quarantine rules and i mean I, I can't even imagine that they lift this while we're still seeing tens of thousands of people getting infected every day and uh, you know the virus itself has not changed it's not like people are getting less sick now you still have the same COVID-19 virus that we were talking about before. Yeah. And it's also the same virus, uh, which actually in the past uh, made it mandatory to stay at home for 14 days. So we already shortened it to seven days, while uh, many health experts actually recommended to stay at home 
at least eight days or around 10 days. So I already felt that seven days is too short. So I'm really glad that they decided to wait a little bit more to make re-evaluations. And also uh, what Po Gyeong mentioned about a possible resurgence later in the year. In fact, um, an official today did mention that if we we are expecting a resurgence, a new wave in the latter half of the year that could be around September or October. But if we do lift this uh, measure, then uh, we could see a hike in cases already in June. So, yeah, I think we should really wait more before we lift that me measure. Yeah, I, I, just right now isn't the right time. Mm. Um, if you remember, it's always when we start seeing a decline. We're, so we're finally seeing a decline to the point where now it's in, what is it, the 20,000s yeah. right now. Uh, we saw it high as uh, 620,000 mm. at the very peak. Mm -hmm. So even though 20,000s, it's very high. It's significantly lower than what we saw. But the trend that we saw for the two plus years is when we start seeing a decline and we start easing measures is when we start seeing spikes once again. And again, the BA4, the BA5, from what I understand, even if you caught the, the Omicron variant, the BA4, BA5, you can get this again. Right. Right. So, and this is the big concern, but I'm not concerned necessarily about the, I guess, the, the 20s and the 30s and maybe even up to the 40s, the senior citizens, right? I, that, that's still the big concern right now. So, I, I think even, I don't know, maybe come June, uh, even, I'm not even sure if June's the right time, because they're saying like, with June 20th, they'll, mm. they'll think about it or something like that. And but. Uh, imagine that a person that has been infected with COVID-19 goes outside without a mask on mm. because outdoor masks are not mandatory anymore. Yeah. And uh, how can you say that someone has COVID-19 or not? Yeah, but see, here's the thing. If I, and I'm just putting it out there, I don't know who's listening to this mm. right now, right? If we get to the part where the seven day uh, quarantine p thing gets lifted, right? Please stay home is what you're going to say. <laughs> well, because I, I think it's recommended that number one, you should stay home. Number two, the least you can do, even if you decide you're going to, all right, so you decide you want to go out, right? Because you don't want to stay home, whatever you decide. Wear your mask. That's the least you can mm -hmm. do. Right. I mean, just because we have the outdoor mask uh, mandates, uh, you know, lifted doesn't mean that you, you don't we have to take it off. So I think the most important thing is not only protecting yourself, but protecting people around you as well. Uh, Kay, who's listening to our program for the ninth show, uh, says to keep the isolation rule is the right decision, as some people can be infectious up to 10 days, which, you know, so you were saying like eight, nine days. I, I don't think seven days is it. Hmm. Um, you could still test. I, I was talking to a buddy of mine who uh, recently had COVID and uh, they put him on seven day. It's in New York. It's still seven days. And then for, for fun, he tested himself uh, on the ninth day. He was still testing positive. But and they would they would remain positive until let's say even like more than ten days. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. and that's just the thing, right? So even though we cut it down to seven, I think that's still dangerous. But what can you do? Um, and yes, Kay does say you have to consider senior citizens and those with underlying health conditions. So, uh, from what I understand, when I talked to uh, some of the uh, health experts, they were saying that in other parts of the country where they've lifted the mandatory uh, quarantine, there's still a recommendation in place, which means that workplaces aren't going to force you to come into work. But if you decide for some reason that you are going to come to work, then, I mean, they can't do anything. But there's still a recommendation uh, in place here. I also want to quickly mention, SJ, you mentioned that uh, we should especially be careful about the seniors around us. But, you know, even the 43 fatalities in the past day, they included people in their 50s as well. So we are still seeing deaths in many age groups. So it's really still everyone who can be really vulnerable to this. Also, I believe since the Omicron outbreak began, uh, there's been about 30 children who died. Mm. Now, those are, see, those are the things that we don't really talk about, right? We just mm. only, only see the, the number, 43 deaths, but among them, who are they, right? So I think the misconception that if your child gets infected with COVID-19, it's okay. I, you know, for the most part, maybe yes. Uh, but still, uh, there are cases where children also unfortunately die because of uh, COVID-19. So, yeah, it, it's not it's too early to say it's not dangerous right now because there are people uh, who are losing their lives. Uh, but uh, going into North Korea, because we've been kind of following very closely North Korea, too. Uh, the total suspected. Now, we use the word suspected because they keep saying, you know, the fever of unknown causes. Uh, cases surpassed two million. What exactly are the figures here, Paul Gyeong? 
Right, so the Korean Central News Agency reported on Friday over 260,000 new suspected COVID-19 cases, with the total number of cases surpassing 2 million, which is only eight days after it first confirmed the virus outbreak. According to the data from the State Emergency Epidemic Prevention Headquarters, more than 263,370 people showed symptoms of fever and two deaths were reported over a 24-hour period until 6 p.m. the previous day. The total number of fever cases since late April stood at more than 2.24 million as of 6 p.m. Thursday, of which more than 1.48 million have recovered and at least 754,810 are being treated. The country has also reported a total of 65 deaths. North Korea has been reporting a daily tally of around 200,000 cases, but the numbers are not deemed to be reliable. According to the National Intelligence Service, the regime is reporting the number of new infections on a daily basis to reassure the public that it is in control of the situation. Yeah, and the number of deaths I think they're reporting on it, I don't think that's real. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they just don't have the capacity to test everybody. I don't think the numbers that are coming out are real. Um, they can certainly control that, right? And uh, you could use that for uh, propaganda measures uh, at this time. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to our last piece of story here. Uh, this was something that we've been waiting for. It has been uh, prolonged for quite a bit. Uh, the pick, Yoon seok pick for Prime Minister Han duk Su. Of course, there was a lot of back and forth uh, with the current ruling party and the main opposition Democratic Party, which, by the way, still holds the vast majority at the parliament. Uh, the DP, they did agree uh, in the confirmation hearing to uh, prove the confirmation of Han Duk Su. Uh, let's get the details of this, Hoa. Right. Uh, we are expecting an approval, which will be the result of a 300-seat parliament that's dominated by the main opposition Democratic Party, which holds 167 seats. So the DP reportedly has decided to confirm a nominee Han Dok Su as prime minister, according to an official. Now, the National Assembly was set to have started a plenary session this Friday at 6 p.m. after having a delay for two hours. So uh, we don't know whether this has been made official as of yet. But they did mention before the plenary session that they are going to give the green light. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this, as the confirmation of a prime minister, needs parliament's approval, different from other cabinet positions. Now, Han has served both left and right leaning governments in the past uh, prime minister during the Nomuyan administration, as well as the ambassador to the US during the Imyongbak administration. So uh, he's got expertise uh, in economy and diplomacy. Now, before the confirmation hearing uh, this morning, Han told reporters that he hopes for a positive result at the plenary session, adding if the approval process is finalized, he is looking forward to cooperate with all parties on matters at hand, stressing the importance of a complete government to get started as soon as possible. Han noted that politics uh, policies of the rival parties are actually similar in vision and purpose, but that there are some differences in methodology. But he said there there is nothing that cannot be overcome. Uh, President Yoon Song yeol also answering reporters' questions this morning, ex expressed hopes for the National Assembly to give the green light to Han, uh, reiterating that the candidate was picked in consideration of forming a coalition government and that he had him in mind from the very beginning. Uh, this was actually his response towards a question on whether Han's approval can alter the future of Health Minister nominee Jung Woo Young, who has been strongly opposed by the DP, but Yoon appears not to be a bargaining with the two nominees. And I also want to mention yeah. that earlier the DP, DP had actually said that nominee Han Dok Su is um, unqualified for the job. But now I believe there the the why the DP is giving the green light has a lot to do with elections coming up in June. Uh, and that is why they kind of, you know, the consensus of uh, the people is that they want this approval. Yeah, yeah. It, it also doesn't look uh, too good on the DP if they start uh, holding back. Uh, Chang Wo-young, of course, the confirmation of that, or I mean, they don't need a confirmation. The, the hearing for that uh, has been going widely uh, controversial because of uh, some of the scandals that have been popping up. We also saw the education minister nominee, of course, resign days before 
uh, over some of the allegations regarding uh, cho- their children as well. Uh, for our listeners out there, once again, uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, currently over in Pyeongtaek at the Samsung Electronics uh, Chip Factory. Uh, he is expected to hold talks uh, and address uh, not to mention uh, holding an address with uh, U.S. Uh, sorry, uh, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol at around 7.15 p.m. We are going to play the live feed of that through Arirang News. So I will also take part in this, uh, talk a bit about that. So do stick around for that. In the meantime, for our, both of our reporters, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, reports today. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you again next week. See you. Have a good weekend. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.